Hi, and welcome to episode number 76 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I am good. How are you doing today? I'm very happy to be back to San Francisco uh, with nice weather and everything uh, after a pretty awesome week in New York. Yeah, very nice. Sounds like yep. you had a bit of fun over there. Yeah, I'm very excited to be talking again about Kubernetes. Last week, we had Henry Goldberg from uh, GKE talking about why container engine is open source and the difference between container engines and Kubernetes. And this week, we have Daniel Smith, a software engineer working in the Kubernetes team, to talk about all the cool new things that come in with Kubernetes 1.6, which came out not that long ago. No, it was several weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Basically, Daniel and I nerd out for about 20 minutes on Kubernetes. Yeah, and I tried to understand some of the things. Uh, <laughs> I, I use Kubernetes, but like I keep it like very like the basics. If you're interested in the really the newest things and like deep, deep technical topics, this episode is going to be for you, I'm sure. You will enjoy it. And then at the end, we have a question of the week, which is kind of cool. It's about like, what do you do when you create a Google Cloud Platform project? Yeah, what are the first things? Yeah, personally. So we will answer them personally. Yeah. Because we actually don't agree. But, you know, whatever. That's good. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. But before that, we have the cool things of the week. And the first one is about this new program. It's called Cloud On Board. Basically, is a full training event that's going to be happening all around the world. For now, it's been announced the dates and places for North America. So we'll have a link in the show notes. And I think that there's a bunch of them. I think I saw Austin. Got Dallas, Austin, and Toronto. Uh, there should be more coming, I expect. Uh, there's 12 cities in US and Canada. Oh, um, yeah. Chicago, Vancouver, San Francisco, LA, Seattle, Atlanta, Boston, Washington, DC, and New York City. So a bunch of them. And even better than that, there's actually also more events uh, on this type. So you can go and learn more about Google Cloud Platform all around the world. So I know that I'll be attending one in... Actually, I'm going to ask uh, Mark to say the capital <sighs> of Argentina. I massacred this before. Um, Buenos Aires? No, Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. That's pretty good. Yeah, there, there you go. So Buenos Aires will be one of those places, but I'm sure will be many more that we'll be announcing sometime soon. So just uh, listen to the podcast and we'll let you know. Yeah, free full day training programs. Yeah, uh, they're really cool. So pretty excited about those. The second cool thing of the week is a very cool thing of the week. It's IPv6. Yeah, so we've got IPv6 uh, finally supported. Uh, well, we have beta. It's in beta. IPv6 termination for HTTPS load balancing, SSL proxying, and TCP proxy load balancing. Yeah. So if you have IPv6 needs, we are able to provide those for you. Yeah, because, you know, I think that this year is the last year. Like, this year is the year of Linux on the desktop. And the <laughs> year we run out of IPv4 addresses. I think this is the same year. Linux on the desktop is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to use IPv6, which I definitely recommend, there's actually a couple conferences that already moved completely to IPv6. Fosdem is one of them. Oh, interesting. Kind of cool. It forces you to, up to update a lot of different things. But, yeah, uh, if you want to use it, check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes. And then the last cool thing of the week comes from Mete Atamel, which is a developer advocate, uh, Google Cloud Platform, specialized in .NET technologies. And he's based in London, if I, don't rem if I remember correctly. And he wrote a really cool blog post on gRPC, specifically from the point of view of everybody says that gRPC is really good to have interoperation or support to have multiple prime languages in the same system. Is that actually true? So he talks about how to make something that you have a server written in Java and the client is actually written in .NET, actually using C Sharp, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. and, and it is really cool. And actually, if you don't know gRPC that much, we have a couple episodes on gRPC, I think. Yeah, we do. So uh, episode 15, gRPC with Farron Talwar, PM for gRPC. We go through that. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a great chat with Brandon Phillips from CoreOS in episode 43. Oh, yeah, that was really good. Which was really, really good. Uh, and in episode 53, we have one of our fellow developer advocates, Sandeep Dinesh, comes and join us and talks about how he and I put together the game Simon and used gRPC to make it. Oh, uh, yeah, Simon says that's yeah, cool. Make Get very scalable and multiplayer over the internet. Yeah, so check it out. I'm going to be talking about gRPC more often now because I did a little demo with Go, and it is an amazing experience. I gRPC really like is it. really nice. No, yeah. I agree completely. 
So yeah, check it out. Check the episodes out. We have all of those links in the show notes as usual. So yeah, why don't we go have a chat with Daniel uh, about Kubernetes? We should probably give a little small proviso before we jump in. Yeah. Because Daniel and I do nerd out a lot about some of the more advanced features that have come in Kubernetes. So if you are new to Kubernetes, don't feel like these are features you have to use. These are really just there for if the default things like services and deployments aren't necessarily working for you in the way that you need it to for your very specific workload, yeah. this is the configuration options that Kubernetes gives you to enable to tailor it to exactly what you need. But if you're just getting started with Kubernetes, maybe have a listen, keep it in the back of your head in case one day you're like, oh, there was this thing I might need. But if you're just getting started, it's interesting, but you don't have to worry about yeah, it too much. I, I think that is telling that these are features that were not included in Kubernetes until version 1.6, and yes. many people are using it in production already. So very probably you don't need them, but if you want to know about them, Daniel is here to tell us about it. Cool. So let's go chat with him. So I'm very happy to welcome to the podcast uh, Daniel Smith. Daniel, uh, you are a software engineer and TL, uh, tech lead or team lead, I, I'm actually not even sure, at some random weird part of Kubernetes, GKE. Tell us about <laughs> it. What do you do? What do you do at Google? Hi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not sure what TL stands for either. <laughs> I, so I'm the I'm the TL of the API machinery sub team at uh, Kubernetes. We've broken the, t the as the Kubernetes team has grown, we've broken it into a bunch of small groups, uh, smallish groups. Uh, so my my group is the API machinery group, and our goal is to take care of the API machinery. So this is this is the stuff, the the sort of the guts of Kubernetes, the plumbing between clients and servers and between uh, the server and the storage backend, making client libraries, making the, the stuff that lets people write new APIs. Ooh, so does that mean you're responsible for client-go? <laughs> yeah, I've used that. <laughs> oh, good. It was good. I used it. It was. It worked well. We we will try not to go over what uh, what I think about uh, Go's dependency management system. Okay, so let's continue talking about something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have you today to talk about the latest Kubernetes version, uh, Kubernetes one dot six. Yes. I was going to say one dot eight because that is Go, but no, it is one dot six. And uh, also, we'll talk at some point the fact that you just migrated also to uh, Kubernetes just migrated to Go 1.8. So pretty happy about that. So what is, what is new in Kubernetes 1.6? What is the biggest pieces of information you think everybody should know? If you look at our documentation, we've got a number of areas. We've increased the scale. Federation is uh, to beta. RBAC is to beta. RBAC is a security feature. Um, there's some new scheduling tricks that you can do. A few other things. I would let's talk about scale because obviously scale and federation those seem to be two fairly hot topics. Uh, I believe Kubernetes now goes up to five thousand nodes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so we now enforce our or we we promise our SLO over five thousand nodes, five thousand node clusters. This and and the SLO is we respond the control plane responds to API requests in under a second, ninety nine percent of the time. I was going to say so that's that's interesting. Can you tell us actually like how that was possible? Like what what actually changed? Is there changes under the hood or what happened there so that that would be possible so that that, that can happen? Yeah, the scalability team made a bunch of changes to make this happen. Uh, one of the larger ones is switching to etcd version 3. We were previously on etcd 2. That was actually a pretty large effort. Yeah. That was uh, done by Wojciech and Poland and my own team member Matt here put in a lot of work getting that set up, and we had lots of help from friends at CoreOS. So is it is it true uh, that at CD3, uh, one of the biggest changes is that it actually uses gRPC instead of REST? Is that what you think brought the, the uh, performance gain? So uh, that's that's actually uh, a detail about the etcd client library. Um, so yes, it does. It does use uh, gRPC, um, but we actually got that benefit just by switching to the client library. So etcd itself scales better if you uh, if you use the version three format. Oh, nice, very cool. Um, and yeah. like we know, federations are pretty big things with Kubernetes. Can you tell us sort of a what is what is Kubernetes federation, and b like what's new in one point six that we can take advantage of now? 
you know, after you get a cluster to a certain size, it becomes very problematic if something goes wrong, right? So after a certain size, it's better to start running multiple clusters and, and uh, you know, you don't want the blast radius to be too big if something happens to your control plane. So federation is a way of presenting multiple clusters under a single control plane. It's not new. We've had it for a while, but it is it is growing up, and I think it, it went to beta this time around. And it, it can do it can do some things like manage pods for you, manage replication controllers. I think it's got uh, services, so you can you can sort of manage multiple clusters at the same time. How does it look when you use uh, federation? Does that mean that kubectl has a special mode? Uh, so you when you deploy, it deploys to the world, or what does it look like? Yeah, I, so I'm a little bit in danger of telling you stuff I don't know, but uh, uh, yeah, you point uh, you point your cube control, uh, you set your cube config file to point to the federation control plane, and and uh, it's got its own set of controllers that just maintain configuration. Like, say you want a you want a service to to run in in multiple clusters, you can make a uh, it looks just like the the regular config file from Kubernetes, and uh, there's maybe a couple extra fields that help it find uh, how many how many clusters in which clusters you want it to run. Nice. So uh, I guess that since we've talked about how you can run bigger jobs through both larger clusters and also many clusters through Federation, the next thing that you mentioned was RBAC. What is, what is RBAC? What does it stand for? Ah, what does it stand for? How, how about I tell you what it does? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Ro is it role-based um, access control? Yeah, role-based access control. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so... so uh, uh, Basically, Kubernetes is starting to grow up, and we're getting more fine-grained control over security. When people think of security, I think there's sort of two topics uh, that that covers. One is identity, or what we call authentication, and the other is permissions, or what we call authorization. And uh, so RBAC is about authorization. It is a way of specifying sort of uh, really really fine-grained permissions on various aspects of your of your cluster. So you could you can specify a, a, like a resource, a verb and an actor, a, a person or or a group and uh, say, you know, yes, you can do this. No, you can't. And uh, so this is more fine-grained than we've had previously. Well, I, I think we've had RBAC previously, but it's going to beta this time around. So it's kind of like IAM, but for Kubernetes specifically. Yeah, it is exactly like IAM for Kubernetes. It is more fine-grained. Okay, yeah. cool. So if I'm a large organization and I want to have certain maybe senior developers who are able to push to production, but maybe my more junior people, I'm going to let them push to dev or staging, then I've got controls there that I'm able to take advantage of to do that. Yeah, absolutely. What's the um, the authorization hooks there? Like, should I be able to hook that into, I don't know, like an LDAP system or my own custom authentication or what, what's available there? Kubernetes supports multiple ways of getting identity. So LDAP is a, will give you identity if you if you're running a GKE installation, then you get identity from the Google system. One of the things we added is a subject access review API. Uh, so you can actually, if you have permission to do it, you can you can actually call a Kubernetes control plane and, and ask, does this person have permission to do this thing on this on this cluster? Sure. Okay, cool. So the thing that I'm actually personally quite excited about and something I've been playing with a bit is the advanced scheduling stuff. I think this is yeah. super, super cool. There's, there's several different things here. Um, which one do we want to talk about first? So there's a whole bunch of stuff around pod affinity that I think is really interesting. Can you tell us about that? I was reading about it last night just to make <laughs> sure uh, I understood it. There's a couple different uh, affinity settings. There's there's affinity for nodes and affinity for pods. Affinity for nodes is like you know you'd prefer or you you must your your pod prefers a particular node or it must schedule on a particular node. Pod affinity is even more interesting. That is for situations where you want to be co-located with a with another set of pods, or you want to be not co-located with with a set of pods. So pod affinity is for when you want to schedule taking account of the other pods that are on a node or in an availability zone. Uh, so it's if you have pods that need to be scheduled together or shouldn't be scheduled together. Suppose you have workloads that need high bandwidth communication between each other like you're doing some sort of machine learning something, and uh, you want them to be in a network segment that has high connectivity. So you you may, you, you can set up labels on your node saying like what your topology is, and uh, you can sort of select over what other, what other pods have been scheduled in this 
topology section uh, and do I want to be scheduled close to those pods or or maybe you want to spread for disaster tolerance you you could uh, say I want to be scheduled away from these other pods so an interesting question then um, so I can have multiple containers running inside a given pod why would I choose to mm -hmm. use pod affinity to bring other pods together versus putting them all together in the same pod just with multiple containers what what benefits do I get there I think that's really for um, very different use cases. Like, uh, if you're putting multiple things inside one pod, you're saying that your scaling is literally one to one. Hmm. If, if you know, if you have like a I don't know a web front end and a, a database syncer in one pod, you are getting exactly one of those one of each every time you scale up or scale down. If you have services that need to scale separately but still be co-located, like maybe you've got one database that serves several different web services. The services may need to be close to the database, but you don't want to scale one-to-one. Uh, -one. So in that case, you want separate pods for each. So you're talking about on the pod side, you've got ways to coordinate where pods should be close to each other or, or affinity against each other, but then you can also control things on the node side as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So th there's a new beta feature, uh, node taints. And uh, I like to think of this as like the role-playing game sense of like the node is tainted mm. by some some dark mm. magic. Uh, this is uh, this is you. You're basically setting a flag on the on the node, um, and then the system will prevent any pod that doesn't tolerate that flag from landing on the node. So you could use this for like if you've got nodes that have GPUs or local SSD, and you want m normal pods not to schedule on those because you want to you want to leave you want to leave those free for workloads that really take advantage of the unique feature. So you could you could taint those those nodes with say you know GPU true, and uh, then only pods that actually say I tolerate the GPU taint can can land there. You can use this to do all sorts of cool stuff. Along the same lines, there's a alpha feature. So so the system is continuously health checking nodes. And uh, after a while, it will, like if a node stops calling, if a, if a node stops phoning home, the system will set its status to unknown. And if it doesn't, doesn't uh, come back, it will eventually just kick all the pods off of the node. You can now set some flags and treat that event as a taint itself. So you can sort of control how long your pods will are willing to tolerate a node that is possibly unresponsive. So the question I kind of have is like it sounds like pod affinity and node taints kind of do the same things but it from different directions. When should I choose one over the other? Uh, I think clearly if you if you want to if you want your pods to do stuff based on other pods in the system then you definitely want to use pod affinity. If you want your pods to schedule depending on facts about your nodes then you probably want to use node taints. The other distinction is uh, taints are for keeping pods off of nodes and affinity is for getting pods onto nodes. So uh, if you really want to set up an exclusive relationship, you need both. All right. So the, the final thing on the advanced schedule stuff, which is also kind of interesting, is custom schedulers. I mean, up until this point, Kubernetes has kind of had the scheduler, which has kind of been the one true way. Um, but now you can kind of mess with it a bit. What's that all about? So specifically, this feature is you leave the default scheduler running and you start up your own scheduler beside it. You can set with a field in your, in your pods which scheduler you would like your pods to be scheduled by. And you can do this, um, I, I don't know, maybe maybe if you've got some special logic that isn't covered by affinity or taints or spreading, or, like if you've got something custom that needs to happen, you can write a scheduler that does that for you, and then you can have your pods go through that scheduler instead of the default one. And I think I saw one of our teammates, Ian Lewis, uh, help write with a blog post for uh, the Kubernetes blog. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes, wherein I think I saw, yeah, he wrote a custom scheduler in Bash. <laughs> so there doesn't seem to be a limit on the language that you can write your custom schedulers uh, in. Is that is that correct? <laughs> You know, one of the one of the best things about Kubernetes, I think, is is just the fact that our APIs are truly open. Like, there's no secret APIs. All of all of the all of the stuff that the default system components do is stuff you can do. And you know, you can do it through the Go client library. You can do it through Kube Control and Bash. Doesn't the system doesn't really doesn't really care what's on the other end of the API? We're starting to 
come out with libraries in other languages. There's a pretty full-featured Python library now. So yeah, you you can write it in Bash. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, if that's what floats your boat. <laughs> cool. So uh, I had a question regarding not uh, scheduling anymore, but sometimes you want to scale your cluster. You need more volumes. You need storage. The only way to create this is either you create it by yourself or you want to create it like automatically. And I think in 1.4, dynamic provisioning was added and there's something new about it but i don't know what it is what's going on with dynamic storage provisioning so i think this this feature is pretty awesome um let me give some background on the on the storage system in kubernetes because a a large part of kubernetes is workload portability right we want you to be able to write your application targeted at Kubernetes and then run it in multiple cloud environments. Now, it turns out that multi- that cloud environments don't all do storage volumes the same way. So to get around this, we have a, a concept which is persistent volume, and we have another concept called persistent volume claim. And the idea is you write your workload to talk to a persistent volume claim, and you allocate persistent volumes from the cloud provider. So if you go to a different cloud provider, all, all that has to change is the logic that's producing the volumes. Like your application doesn't, doesn't even notice. And so what's new here is that there's a, there's a storage class that's introduced, a storage class object. And that is basically a thing that can automatically produce uh, persistent volumes. So it frees cluster administrators from having to do that. Nice. So... I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned the uh, storage claim. Uh, Could that be seen as basically the API that someone needs to satisfy to be able to provide storage volumes for Kubernetes? Which means that basically like there's one for uh, Google Cloud, but also if you want to run it on other cloud provider or even on-premise, that's what you should be implementing? So so, uh, if you wanted to, to port Kubernetes to a particular cloud environment, the thing that you want to produce is a, a controller, a controller logic. So, so uh, I haven't looked at I, I, I haven't looked at the dynamic storage provisioning feature in uh, like a code level, but uh, there must be a controller. Uh, and if you wanted to port to a different uh, cloud environment, you would write an implementation of that controller. Cool. That would look for like unsatisfied claims uh, against a storage class, and then you'd, you'd select the appropriate like volume settings, size, etc. from your cloud environment. Cool. Um, is there any other like I know the I mean those seem to be the big highlights. I think we've covered there. But are there any other like little things that have also been added that are kind of cool and interesting? Sort of some under the hood stuff. I think is probably worth mentioning. A bunch of work has been done in uh, on, on something called a container runtime interface, and and this 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 effort is is probably not super user visible but it will make some things easier for us in the future and the, basically the idea is uh, kubelet which is the node agent has two responsibilities basically like on one side it's it's talking to the kubernetes api and getting workloads and reporting back etc and on the other side it's talking to the container runtime which is usually docker and is starting starting containers stopping them so the container runtime interface is, is effort is to sort of split this down the middle and let the container runtime part of that be out of process to kubelet so that it's easier for for people to implement that kubelet can focus on correctly implementing the kubernetes api another another cool thing that that kubelet is doing and this, i'm i'm excited about this because it is fixing a uh, long standing issue that we've had sometimes is kubelet is now uh, declaring space for system daemons called this feature node allocatable and the idea is you know, it's the system components like Kubelet itself, Docker, uh, other daemons that are running on the system, they take up some RAM, they take up some CPU. And if you don't take that into account, the scheduler will stuff so much stuff onto the node that it will uh, go out of memory and start killing things. So it's it's pretty cool to have, have this uh, put into the node stats so that the scheduler can take account of this and, and not over overload nodes. Cool. Um, now, we've I think we've covered all the stuff that's pretty much available and in beta, but we've had some new alpha features as well that... 
I know I know we don't necessarily support out of the box without clicking some checkboxes and saying this is fine if you set yourself on fire. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about? Yeah, you can make an alpha cluster, but you can yeah, exactly. It. Uh, it's it's so. all on you. Um, but yeah, what what new alpha features are available uh, right now? So one thing I'm excited about is out of tree cloud providers, which is we're splitting our uh, there's multiple control plane components in Kubernetes, and one of them is called a controller manager, and that uh, sort of groups all the various controllers that are that are running the system. Kubernetes is kind of built out of this control loop pattern where we have these these components that that basically are doing one thing and they're they're watching, you know, they're watching your replica set. It wants five pods, they're looking at the cluster, you only have four, so it'll make a new one. The whole system is built out of this sort of control loop. We're sort of splitting that binary up so that the ones that are specific and uh, married to a to a cloud provider are in a different binary, so that you can run the standard controller manager binary and also the one appropriate for your uh, for your cloud environment. If you were doing a bare metal installation or something, you could just take a look at that skeleton, see what it provides, and write your own implementation. Another thing I'm excited about, which is which is uh, alpha support, is, is uh, GPUs. So we handle GPUs as uh, resources on on nodes now. Could you? T- Tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, what does it look like to say I want to use GPUs? Like, let's say there's someone that wants to do like video game stuff and they need the video rendering or stuff. How does it look? You know, I haven't played with that particular feature, so I'm probably not the best person to ask. You know, I thought it was targeted more towards machine learning. Oh, interesting. Uh, it, maybe, it, maybe it probably also works for for people who need to do renders, but uh, I, I think it's targeted towards uh, yeah, it's a good learning. point. So more more exposure of the CUDA stuff and. And that kind of stuff, and those sort of like Nvidia cards and things like that. Yeah, I don't know that we go into that level of detail. I think it's just the Kubelet notes that hey, I've got this many GPUs available, and then the scheduler can see that pods want you know one to a few GPUs, and and it, it can it can uh, track that as a resource. Cool. One more question I wanted to ask you is, uh, do you know a little bit about how? Was it to migrate to go on the date? Was it an easy thing or? Uh, yeah, so so we did just get to go 1.8. I think we got there yesterday, uh, maybe the day before. Uh, so Kubernetes 1.6 is still built with uh, 1.7. Mm. Uh, but on head, uh, we are on uh, go 1.8. And it seems cool so far. I've been running it on my personal system for a while. I'm excited to see more. Cool. Uh, yeah, we, we are running out of time a bit, but uh, what's on the roadmap for Kubernetes going forward? I saw there have been drops on 1.7 for, for like alpha releases and stuff, but what sort of stuff can we see coming down the pipeline? I'll just focus on what, what I and my team are working on. I think we've got some cool stuff planned. Uh, something that... The, the sorts of things that get me excited in Kubernetes are, are the things that make it easier for the ecosystem to develop and, and for us to get more components that, that op- interoperate with Kubernetes. And so in that vein, we're working on uh, API aggregation. This is the idea that you can like take your own API and aggregate it seamlessly with the Kubernetes API. We have various f- folks in the ecosystem like uh, OpenShift who are basically are operating something that's very very similar to kubernetes but it's actually a it's actually a fork if you look under the hood like like they they have very painful merges uh, when kubernetes increments version so so the idea here is is the people who want to add this sort of api can run it on top of kubernetes instead of operating a fork. And this this should make it much easier to add APIs. You should be able to add multiple APIs in the same cluster. So yeah, this is, this is what I'm looking forward to. Is that like linked to like third-party resources? Is that kind of in that, that same vein as people who want to add their own resources to Kubernetes and make it do special things? Yeah, it is, it is similar. And uh, this was a really hot topic last quarter. Uh, and if you poke around the API machinery SIG docs, you'll find one that I put out there that was comparing and contrasting the two. I think the, the short story is that uh, Kubernetes needs both third-party resources and API aggregation going forward. Uh, third-party resources, the target audience there is it's really easy to get something up and running. It doesn't take a lot of uh, a lot of effort. It works with queue control already. So it's just like low effort, easy to use, not necessarily full featured and the idea with uh, aggregation api aggregation is a little bit more heavyweight probably you're only going to do this if you really want to fundamentally alter 
uh, or or add some some really fundamental API concept. But you would you would do this. We offer we're going to offer a, a library. You'd compile. You'd run your own API server. You you uh, make an entry in the aggregation API, and then that that would get integrated with Cube Control. And and if you do things that way, you'll get all the all the power of the API system. So you can do all the fancy validation you want. You can write super custom admission controller. You can do strange defaulting, hmm. anything you like. Great. I think that we're pretty out of time by now. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time to tell us a little bit about all the cool things that are coming with Kubernetes 1.6. It's very interesting. Cool. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. So thanks, Daniel, for such an interesting conversation. There was a lot of those things that I'm not sure I completely understood what they were for, uh, because, you know, like there's really advanced stuff there. If you felt that way, do not fear. That's normal, I guess. <laughs> but uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. It was really, really interesting. And it makes you think about like all of those little features that probably you will not need, but the day you will need them, they're there. Cool. So why don't we have a chat about the question of the week? I thought this would be a bit interesting if we just talked a little bit about, so you create a Google Cloud Platform project. Yep. What's the first thing you do? Let me say my things first. Uh, so normally what I do is I create my projects all the time from the console, from console.cloud.google.com. I do the same. And then what I do is I go to my terminal and I do gcloud init to set up all the configuration so whenever I do anything from gcloud, it will be actually referring to that. Yep. And I do this partly because I have three different accounts linked to my oh, gcloud. Yeah. Yep. So I want to make sure that I do what I do in the project that I'm trying to, otherwise you'll get errors and it's, it's kind of annoying. Do so, you use configuration? Or do you just use the just read like reauth on the same account? I, yeah, I do not use configurations. Okay, I, I just do reauth, and it's very easy. Uh, it works pretty well. There's a product manager for GCloud here. I wish that I could have directory dependent configurations. That would be nice. Consider it as a, as a feature request. Feature request <laughs> from the podcast. But yeah, just GCloud in it, and that works pretty well. And then, well, uh, right after that, I'm gonna go to to the console again. And since very often what I'm doing is I'm gonna be running somehow. Compute and uh, compute the engine instances, uh, and you need to activate that API. What I do is I go to the compute engine tab, and then just by clicking there, the API starts activating. That takes a couple of minutes, so it's always the th first thing you do. You don't pay for having it activated. Mm. So even like I really it's like sometimes I deploy an app engine, I still will activate the app, the just API. Just have it, just because you know that's what I do. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And then check that like billing account is set up and all of these things so I can actually start working on the project directly. What about you? So uh, I'm very similar to you in that I set up my project through uh, console.cloud.google.com. You, you, uh, you don't use the uh, deployment manager for that? <laughs> so you could. You could, I you know. Can. That's <laughs> you can. I haven't, I haven't played with that yet, but I may one day soon. In fact, maybe I will. Maybe I will do that now that I think <laughs> about it because I have a few steps. So the first thing I do actually is I make sure I have multiple owners on the account. I started with my email address and then I have a secondary email address that I use to make sure there are multiple emails on the account just in case. Always a good thing to have just in case one account, something happens to it. Yeah. And then you can still have access to your projects. Um, ideally, multiple people is a good idea. But yeah, multiple owners is always good. And then basically, this is like not really a step, but the, I make sure that the emails, the owners of my accounts, I make sure those are email accounts that I actually look at on a regular basis. Because if anything goes bad with your project, um, in fact, we had a conversation with uh, the abuse team at one point, yep. right? If anything bad happens with your project, say somebody compromises one of your systems or something like that happens, then that's the email address you're going to get a message at too. So you want to receive those. Those are really important because otherwise you can get your project shut down and that would be sad. Yep. And that would make you very, very sad. So um, definitely, I like having multiple owners and making sure that those emails are monitored. Going back to the topic you were talking about abuse and support, mm -hmm. um, yeah, reading those emails is really important yeah because you know when you receive one of those emails they're actually important and you need to answer them there's two episodes where we cover a little bit about this and the best practices on like how to make sure that your projects are following the terms of services and all of these things uh, there's episode 47 with cloud abuse and we had Swati Kushreft and Emeka Okonkwo and then on episode 24 we also had Terence Shepard talking about Google Cloud Platform support we yeah we cover all the little things that you may want mm -hmm. to do. Especially, I'd say that the biggest piece of advice is make sure those emails do not go to like some account that nobody reads. Yeah, don't send them to DevNull. Like, don't do that. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah. 
Well, Francesc, uh, it's wonderful talking to you with you again. Uh, where are you going to be in the next few weeks? What are you up to? So next week I will be here in San Francisco for Gopher Fest. Uh, that's going to be on Monday. And after that, I will be on my way to some really quick holidays. And by the end of the month, I'll go to Buenos Aires for the onboard event. That's going to be pretty cool. And next, I will be going to QCOM. I'm actually very excited about that. Oh, cool. I have this video, uh, Go Tooling in Action, Yep. that pretty uh, popular. And I'm making a workshop out of that. And I'll very be nice. running it on QCOM New York. So I'm pretty excited about that. That'll be at the end of June. What about you? Uh, so next week, I will be off to Sweden for Nordic Games Conference, nice. which will be lots of fun. Uh, I'll make a shout out. I'm not going to be there, but if anyone's in San Francisco on Saturday, uh, the second part of the Playcrafting and Extra Life uh, Game Jam is their Game Fest, which is this weekend. Cool. And basically, it's a free event for 24 hours. You can go play games. Uh, they're going to be streaming stuff, just basically raising money for kids in hospitals. So super, super cool. Um, and it's in Launchpad Space here in San Francisco. Make sure we'll link to that. And then I go on some holidays for a bit as well, actually. Very nice. Yeah. I heard that there's this little event, Google I.O. Oh, yeah, that is coming up, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) You will not be attending. I will not be attending. I'll be in Sweden. I will not be attending. Okay. But I know that many of you might be attending. Let us know how it goes. We're going to be interviewing uh, some people about some things that might be happening at Google I.O. And you'll have an episode on that after. That was very vague. I like it. I know. It's very secret. (laughs) Nobody knows what's going on. And what's great is we could slot in anybody and no one would know. Exactly. Thanks, Mark, so much for uh, such an amazing episode. I feel like this episode without you would have been way harder (laughs) because we didn't know who we're talking about. So thank you so much. And thank you to you, Francesc. And thank you very much to everyone who's listening. See you all next week. See you all next week. 